Goedemorgen, good morning, bon dia, en welkom bij de Rijversdagen 2023. Ik wil ten eerste alleen Carla, Nathalie en alle andere commissieleden hartelijk bedanken voor hun uitnodiging om hier vandaag voor jullie allemaal te mogen staan. Ik ben heel blij om de mogelijkheid te krijgen om jullie iets te vertellen over de huidige stand van de archeologie van slavernij. En ik ga dat in het Engels doen voor de toegankelijkheid, want ik heb begrepen dat de opnames van vandaag op YouTube zullen komen te staan. So, good morning and thank you for being here today during this Herdenkingsjahr, 150 years after the abolition of slavery. Before I begin, I would like to thank all the people who've contributed to this presentation in some way, my colleagues, co-authors, stakeholders, and family. At the end of the presentation, I will put up a slide showing places where you can find out more. And I will start by asking you to think with me. This is an archaeology conference, and I think I can assume that the majority of people here today are archaeologists, whether students, academics, or professionals. What was it that originally made you want to become an archaeologist? It goes without saying that we are not here for money, fame, or glamour. It is also not the weather, which I can say with confidence from my days working in commercial archaeology in the UK. Perhaps you're thinking about your passion for the subjects, for a desire to know where you came from, and to answer the big questions about who we are and how we came to be here. Perhaps you're excited by the opportunity to solve practical problems. Or perhaps you're thinking about the future. As scholars in the area of futures literacy have noted, it is a common trope in heritage studies that we have a duty to preserve the past for the benefit of future generations. But this presents a problem. How do we know that people in the future will value the same things that we do? The likelihood is, in a rapidly warming and uncertain world, that they will not. If anything is certain about the future, it is that it will be different. Attempts to preserve heritage like a fly in amber may therefore be not only futile, but also misguided. As heritage scholar Sophia Labadie has noted, there are many adverse effects on living populations when heritage professionals try to preserve sites, objects, and practices by freezing them in time. This is particularly important when we consider it in the context of climate change. In the future, stakeholders and archaeologists may have to be intentional about which heritage will be saved, not only where that heritage is, but whose heritage. Now, I'm not here to pour cold water on archaeology, far from it. It was actually a previous Rovensdager keynote speaker in her role as part of the popular British television series Time Team who contributed to my desire to become an archaeologist. In Leiden in 2017, Carenza Lewis spoke about public engagement with archaeology. She said that it is often considered a nice extra rather than an essential. And instead, she called for, quote, a new paradigm for engaging wider publics in the archaeological process in which public engagement is recognized as performing an essential role by enabling archaeology to contribute to wider societal aims." Unquote. I completely agree with her on that. And here we come to the main point that I will argue here today, that the archaeology of slavery in the Caribbean is a flashpoint where the big issues of politics, ethics, and society come to the fore, a flashpoint that has ramifications for our discipline as a whole. So to explore this issue more thoroughly over the next 25 minutes or so, I will be speaking about the Caribbean, specifically the Dutch Caribbean islands, where I have family and where the majority of my work has been located. This group of small islands is vulnerable, not only from ongoing cycles of extraction and exploitation that began with sugar and continue with tourism, but also from increasingly severe climatic events that threaten Caribbean people and their heritage and that are caused by two centuries of commercial capitalism kick-started and still dominated by the colonialist West. It is necessary to understand the impacts that slavery and colonialism have had on this region and on the Netherlands to understand the significance that archaeology can have in slavery studies. As Saidia Hartman calls it, these impacts are the afterlife of slavery. This past is not past. It is all around us. But what is slavery? It is not my intention to define slavery here. Suffice it to say that definitions vary, 
that it has both physical and psychological effects, and that legality has very little to do with it. Arguments for restricting the definition of slavery to a legal state include a fear that making its applicability too broad might lead to hyper-relativism. However, I am not afraid of this. Theory, when used properly, is supposed to focus and direct our thought, to keep us, in many cases, tightly aligned with our socio-political goals without losing sight of the science. When it comes to slavery, a political position is not only methodologically advisable, but ethically essential. It is not enough to come to this topic with a dispassionate gaze. Regarding colonialism, not condemning the perpetrators leads automatically to supporting them. We know this not only from historical events, but also from events happening today. And whether we like it or not, archaeology does get used for political ends. At its worst, archaeological narratives have deliberately been constructed to support fascism, apartheid, genocide, and exclusive nation building. In less extreme, but much more common circumstances, archaeologists have, consciously or unconsciously, made interpretations that excluded, silenced, and misrepresented groups of people who had little opportunity to respond. And thus, to slavery, a state that is today illegal, and yet the Global Slavery Index indicates that it also exists in every region. In the Netherlands, for example, the index estimates that more than one in every 2,000 people are living in modern slavery. It is therefore a type of exploitation that has consistently flouted legal attempts to contain it. Slavery continued after the legal abolition of slavery in the Dutch Caribbean colonies, observable in the Pagatera system in Curaçao and in the apprenticeship system in Suriname. Even before legal emancipation across the Caribbean, free people of color were frequently illegally enslaved, especially if they had no papers to prove their freedom. To ignore the experiences of those enslaved in these systems outside of legal definitions is to continue to participate in a system of exploitation, to obfuscate an uncomfortable past because it intrudes so sharply into the present. It is this discomfort that Gloria Wecker has explored in her book, White Innocence. Focusing only on the parts of history in which a country can be proud, as she notes, is something that colonial powers do to avoid their role in slavery and colonialism. In larger colonial powers, such as in the UK, it may present itself as a focus on the abolition of the slave trade and on winning World War II. In other colonial powers, such as the Netherlands and Denmark, it presents itself as a focus on the smallness of their society and their colonies. Compared to others, it may be easy to believe the impact was less. But in reality, it is redundant to argue that forcing half a million people into slavery is better than one or two million. These are all unimaginable numbers. One person would have been too many, and real people have been and continue to be harmed by this history. Gloria Wecker also notes that the legacy of this history, which she calls the cultural archive, is all around us. She says, the cultural archive is located in many things, in the way we think, do things, and look at the world, in what we find sexually attractive, in how our effective and rational economies are organized and intertwined. Most important, it is between our ears and in our hearts and souls. So how do we see this in archeology? span In her recent opinion piece, Usma Rizvi has noted that archeologists perform a kind of translation, that when we interpret physical evidence, there is always a shift of meaning. How that shift happens depends not only on who is doing the interpreting, but also on their intentionality. Our own prejudices influence the way we interpret archeological evidence. This has been clear all over the world, with archeologists extrapolating biological sex from grave goods and assuming that prehistory was full of male hunters and female gatherers. In the case of slavery, it may have the unfortunate effect of obscuring from view the vast majority of enslaved people in the Caribbean. When faced with the archaeological remains of a plantation village, for example, I've heard archaeologists exclaim that these villages were sometimes hired out to free people, so that we can have no way of knowing whether the evidence we interpret actually relates directly to enslaved people or not. This introduces an unnecessary degree of ambiguity into the archaeological context. The vast majority of plantation villages in the Caribbean in the 18th to early 19th centuries were inhabited by enslaved people. When looking at the balance of probability, therefore, we must regard whataboutery, in this case, what about the free people, as an attempt to evade silence and ignore an uncomfortable history. 
An example from my own work might be the interpretation of material cultural evidence at enslaved villages on St. Eustatius. Archaeologists had in the past observed the booming economy of the island during the late 18th century and argued that slavery there was somehow better or milder than in other places. They noted, for example, the ability of some enslaved people, mainly men, to buy themselves free, as well as spatial quirks of local plantations that may have afforded enslaved people a greater degree of privacy from their enslavers. However, in my work, engagement with oral history and a desire to see the past from the perspective of the enslaved person allowed me to make a different interpretation. When I see a set of beautifully painted plates found in an enslaved village, I do not interpret them as evidence for a good life. Instead, I see them as part of a whole. What do the nice plates matter if tomorrow your family and friends might be sold away from you? If tomorrow might bring death, injury, exhaustion, starvation, disease? In fact, it is Tim Taylor's suggestion that we assume slavery to have existed in all past societies, unless proven otherwise. Thus, all archaeological evidence, whether inside the Caribbean or without, should have the potential to be evidence left by an enslaved person. In the colonial Caribbean, we know that slavery existed, and yet still, there is a reluctance to pronounce certainties in our work. This evasion actually happens from both ends. While colonial period archaeology is currently experiencing a boom in interest amongst the Caribbean archaeological community, this is a very recent trend. The Oxford Handbook of Caribbean Archaeology, published only 10 years ago, had 38 chapters, but only two of them dealt substantively with historical archaeology. I cannot believe that this was because no one found the colonial period interesting. Instead, I have been told that archaeologists have often considered that time period too sensitive or too risky. The marginalization of this time period in our discipline has political implications, for example, impacting upon how we imagine nations and peoples. On the other hand, Dutch society and Europe more broadly have, over the last few years, been experiencing increasing interest in the colonial past. In the Netherlands, books and exhibitions have analyzed the local slavery heritage of Leiden, Utrecht, and Amsterdam, and have encompassed global perspectives on Dutch slavery. But these studies are usually historical, and archaeology is often left out. Most recently, I was very pleased to have been invited to write a piece for the volume Stad in Slavrinae, edited by Rosemary Allen, Esther Captain, Matthias van Rossum, and Owen Feyant. Covering many different topics, this volume is historically wide-ranging, but it left only 800 words for the contributions of archaeology. In the past, I have received positive feedback from historians who stumble across my work in such contexts. They find that archaeology has something fresh to offer, something unique, and I certainly agree. The contribution of archaeology is to provide tangible evidence, an understanding of space, and a physicality that cannot be accessed on the page. It is suited to the study of marginalized groups, and it lends itself to community. Indeed, there is an enthusiastic and participatory audience for archaeology in the Dutch Caribbean. The St. Eustatius Heritage Research Commission's 2022 report included a community survey which showed that 96% of those interviewed had an interest in local heritage, and that 75% had an interest in slavery and colonialism in particular. 78% of those interviewed felt positively about archaeology as a discipline, despite the history of bad behavior that archaeologists have left behind them in this region. Further responses indicated that even the analysis of human remains might be acceptable if it was carried out with appropriate community consultation and engagement. This is certainly what I found in my own work as a PhD student at the University of Kent, as well as in local responses to my book, Slavgemaakt, in 2020. Some of the work I've done that has perhaps had the biggest impact is the analysis of skeletons of two enslaved women who were buried in the Dutch Caribbean. To speak about them is a profound privilege, and I will use my remaining time here to tell you something about their lives. Enslaved women's stories are not often found in historical documents. It is difficult to extract their specific experiences from other archaeological evidence. They are perhaps those whose voices have been most profoundly silenced, erased, and forgotten in colonial and neo-colonial society. But here we can obtain a glimpse into their experiences that is profoundly affecting. And I should say that this glimpse is not going to be literal. We will not be looking at pictures of human remains in this presentation. My first example takes us to the island of Curaçao, 
Located off the coast of Venezuela, it was an important Dutch West India Company freeport from the 17th century onwards. It had two slave depots from which captives were distributed to nearby Spanish territories under the Asiento trading contract. Plantations here mainly grew food for subsistence, and there was animal husbandry. The island was unusual in that it had a very large free African descendant population. This was due to high rates of manumission, not as a kindness, but rather to save enslavers money and resources in times of drought or economic downturn. The burial I will discuss today was found during car park development at the Chamber of Commerce in Willemstad in 1985, and the human remains were rescued from this development by an archaeologist from an organization then known as the Archaeological Anthropological Institute of the Netherlands Antilles. Evidence across her skeleton shows that enslavement had a profound, tangible impact upon this woman's body. After spending her early life in Africa, during late childhood or early adolescence, she experienced an episode of stress so extreme that it caused an interruption in the growth of her dental enamel. This experience could, for example, have been forced passage across the ocean. When she arrived in Curaçao, she was probably housed for a short time in one of the two slave depots along the island's southern coastline. Everything would have been new for her, and she would have heard many people all around her speaking Papiamentu, a language that developed in the multicultural environment of Curaçao's free port. Enduring the humiliation and confusion of the slave auction, she was bought by a wealthy landowner or merchant and taken to their property in Peter Mai, a wealthy suburb of Willemstad. There, she likely worked as a domestic in the seafront mansion belonging to her enslaver. She may also have spent time working on a plantation in the countryside, as wealthy individuals here often owned several properties and moved their enslaved people between town and country. However, we should not perceive domestic labor as easier than field labor, only as different. For enslaved women, the environment of the big house was one where they were at increased risk of psychological and sexual abuse through close contact with their enslavers. Whether her work was household or field labor, it was too much for a growing body. The pressure on her joints caused her knees to click and catch, and she developed strong neck muscles required to carry heavy loads on top of her head. The new disease environment that she was inhabiting, together with conditions of poverty, malnutrition, and stress, would have combined to depress her immune system and make her vulnerable to infectious disease. The impacts of hard labor, illness, and psychological trauma upon this young woman were so severe that her body had no energy left to put into healthy development. When she died and was buried in the yard of the mansion where she'd been forced to labor for several years, she was 18 years old. In many societies, including our own, she would be considered an adult, but she had not yet completed puberty. The development of her skeleton indicates that she had reached the stage of physical development usually found in 12 to 15 year olds. Similar cases of delayed puberty have also been observed in other enslaved individuals. For example, in 15th to 17th century Portugal and in 18th century, century New York. We can imagine that it would have had an impact on her social role, her vulnerability, and perceptions that others had of her. The stresses that caused this probably also contributed to her early death. We can only hope that she was buried by other enslaved people who loved and cared for her. The second example I will talk about is from Saber. This island's steep terrain made it unsuitable for sugar, and instead people here have often made their living from fishing. It was considered a poor island in the 18th century, yet nevertheless its wealthier residents participated in an economy and society that rested upon slave labor. The burial of a woman and her child, I will address here, was accidentally discovered during the excavation of an indigenous site in 2015 by archaeologists from Sabre Archaeological Center and Leiden University. The site was located at a colonial period homestead centered on stock raising, operating from the second half of the 17th century until its destruction by a hurricane in either 1772 or 1780. Nearby was the burial of a complete horse. Horses would have been a rare sight on Sabre, and its burial indicates that the homestead owners were amongst the island's upper class. Both the woman and the horse were buried in simple pits. This is at variance with upper class burials on Saber, where the rocky volcanic geology encourages stone kists rather than earth dug graves. <coughs> Additionally, a census of 1780 records only six free people of African ancestry on Saber, so it is unlikely that the woman buried here was ever a member of the free population. <coughs> 
After spending her early life in sub-Saharan Africa, in later life this woman became a captive and endured the physical and psychological stresses of the Middle Passage. Upon arrival in the Americas, she was probably taken to the slave depot on St. Eustatius and sold at auction to the wealthy owner of the Sabre homestead. She was in her 40s by the time she died and was buried there along with her unborn child, and decades of enslavement had impacted upon her body. During her daily work, repeatedly traversing the steep slopes of the volcano, probably while carrying heavy loads, caused alterations to her ankles and feet. Like the young woman buried in Kurds Sao, the woman buried in Sabre also endured an adverse disease environment. Changes across her skeleton indicate that she was suffering from a chronic infection at the time of her death, possibly Hansen's disease, otherwise known as leprosy. This bacterial infection affects the nerves of the extremities, such as the hands and feet, leading to severe injury and the loss of body parts in advanced stages. It was a highly stigmatized disease in the colonial period Caribbean, and many islands had leprous area where people with Hansen's disease were shut away from the rest of society. It traveled more easily in the crowded conditions of the enslaved people's quarters, and there was no cure. Furthermore, Hansen's disease can have a complicated effect upon pregnant women, which would have influenced the final months of this woman's life. Her reduced immune response during pregnancy would have made her more susceptible to contracting the disease or would have exacerbated an existing condition. Women who give birth while suffering from Hansen's disease often have underweight babies, and this might explain why her child appears two weeks premature, although she was clearly undergoing labor at the time of her death. This is actually the only case that I've come across in my career where the manner of death and perhaps even the cause of death can be ascertained from the skeleton. The woman buried on Sabre had an extremely narrow pelvis which did not allow space for childbirth. This would have resulted in a protracted labor. A common cause of death in these circumstances is massive blood loss due to uterine rupture. We should pause here to think about the fact that in an environment of extreme exploitation where the risk of unwilling pregnancy was so high, it is nothing less than astonishing that this woman was able to survive into middle adulthood. The smallness of her pelvis would almost certainly have caused her death earlier if she had ever carried a child to term before. However, the stress experienced by enslaved women led to low fertility and frequent miscarriages, so her circumstances of death do not preclude the possibility that she had been pregnant before. Her story is heartbreakingly sad, not only because she was enslaved, but also because her pregnancy put her in danger, from which today she could probably have been saved. Hers is a good example of the double colonization written about by Oironke Oyewumi in the 1990s. Enslaved women in the Caribbean faced colonization once as an African and once as a woman. Both the women I have mentioned here embody this in different ways. What archeology span offers, therefore, is a way to hold the past to account. Faced with this evidence, it is very difficult to argue that Dutch colonialism was small, that the lack of a sugar economy meant that slavery in the Dutch Caribbean was somehow milder, that enslavers were good and kind. On the other hand, we should not assume that archeology span is the ultimate or only authority. Caribbean people already know their heritage. The power of oral history is enormous, and in my research I have shown that archeological evidence and oral historical evidence can support each other, providing an important counterpoint to elite narratives. This Herdenkingsjahr, 150 years after the abolition of slavery, stories like these help to build a picture of exactly what representatives of the Dutch state and the Dutch monarchy have recently apologized for. In December 2022, Mark Ritter joined representatives of Denmark, France, the UK, the European Parliament, and the Catholic Church, who have also issued official apologies for slavery. He mentioned that the Dialogue Groups Laverneiverleder report released in 2022 identified three important words, erkenning, excuses, and herstel. He also stressed that this apology was un comma, geen punt. Certainly, this should mark how far we've come over the past 10 years. When I began my PhD in 2014, slavery heritage was not a subject of widespread public discussion. Now, not only the apologies, but also the Black Lives Matter protests in 2020, the increasing criticism of Swarte Piet, and many other indicators have shown that Dutch society has decided to dive headfirst into this topic. However, there has been some criticism of the apologies focus on Suriname, while the six small islands of Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, St. Martin, St. Eustatius, and Sabre 
as well as former Dutch colonies such as South Africa, were left out. Additionally, in order for apologies to be genuine and effective, they must have a specific architecture. Not only must you say you are sorry, but you must also make any necessary reparations. Now, I'm sure that some of you have been sitting here wondering whether I was going to say that word. Well, I will say it again in numbers. The recently released Brattle Report, prepared by Brattle Consultants for the University of the West Indies and the American Society of International Law, indicates that the Dutch state owes between $3,571 and $4,969 billion to Guyana, Suriname, and the Dutch overseas territories. These figures take into account not only the harm done to these regions during the period of slavery, but also since abolition. They include, for example, gender-based violence and psychological trauma, and take into account the vast sums of money paid not to the formerly enslaved people, but to their enslavers when slavery was legally abolished. During this Herdenkingsjahr, the Dutch government is making 200 million euros available for, quote, raising awareness, fostering engagement, and addressing the present-day effects of slavery, unquote. I see this as a committed part of the erkenning mentioned by the Dialog Group Slavernaivrileda. But the Herdenkingsjahr funding is a drop in the ocean compared to what would be required for Herstel. In fact, it is only a tiny fraction of the total calculated by the Brattle consultants. So where does this leave archaeology, trying to come to terms with the implications of its participation in conversations about slavery and colonialism? For one thing, archaeology can be an important part of reparations, by facilitating repatriation of archaeological remains to their rightful homes. In other situations, it may be necessary for us to abandon archaeology altogether. We may also have to take down off their pedestals long lines of Western thinkers whose methodological innovations laid the foundations of our discipline. Instead, it is politically, ethically, and socially conscious thinking that we must cultivate in ourselves and in future generations of archaeologists to ensure that it survives as a discipline that helps rather than harms, that listens rather than dictates, that supports rather than exploits. In addressing this, Usma Rizvi has advised an approach of radical care in archaeology. She says, quote, justice flourishes within frameworks of care, generosity, and a heart-centered approach. These acts of kindness and care are radical within the settler colonial frameworks which inform, code, and maintain archaeological practice in most of the world today a world in which care is coded as unscientific and biased, unquote. At its foundation, therefore, archaeology must have a well of empathy and a willingness to learn from the past and the present. An approach of accessibility, openness, political consciousness, community focus, and giving rather than taking is important not only in the archaeology of slavery, but also in the future of the rest of our discipline. It would be odd to argue that these things are necessary in one place and not in another. A good example from just across the water is that of the Urk Schedels, which were used for fake science that identified the residents of this village as the missing link between modern humans and Neanderthals. After 133 years and a university collection, campaigns for their repatriation succeeded. Since 2010, the skulls have been back in Urk and have been reburied in the local cemetery. The trajectory of the Urk Schedels is a locally situated episode that echoes those happening in Indonesia, South Africa, and the Dutch Caribbean. The echoes of these colonial projects reaching from Curaçao and Saber to Urk and today here to Horn invite us to ask ourselves, whom does my work affect? Whom can it benefit? Not only where did we come from, but also where do we want to go? What kinds of people do we want to be, and what kind of society do we want to make? As an osteologist, I have been taught to maintain an Enlightenment-style scientific distance between myself and the past, but I no longer think that is desirable or ethical. One of the ways I can tell that my work is still effective is through the emotional impact that it has on me. This is human. As archaeologists, we must face the spectre of death every day. We should not let it leave us unmoved. Masha Danki, thank you all, and thank you for listening. <laughs>